So, uh, I've been in a sermon series on the big three. You know who the big three are? Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Gary Player. No, not them. They're just golfers, right? No, I'm talking about the big three, Peter, James, and John. Now, turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 21 through 38. Okay, check this out. Here's Jesus talking. And he's reclining at the table. Jesus says this, But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. So his hands are on the table. And so is Judas. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. But woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them might, might do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Come on, guys. Jesus is about to go to the cross, and you guys are trying to figure out who's the greatest disciple? Are you kidding me? That's the way people are all about ourselves, right? That's the way they were. The disciples were not perfect guys, but Jesus chose them anyways, right? Um, A dispute broke out. Uh, Who's going to be the greatest? But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors or bosses. But you are not like that. You're not like that, disciples. We're not going to act like Gentiles, right? And then he says this. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood with me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Jesus is telling them their future. You guys are worrying about who's the greatest. You need to start serving one another. But one day... You're going to sit on thrones and judge all 12 tribes. You're going to be great. But on this earth, you're going to be the servant. That's incredible. But he replied, uh, let, let's read this. But I have prayed for you. Oh, no. He says this. Simon, Simon. Who's Simon? Peter. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You remember in the book of Job when Satan went up to heaven and asked God if he could attack Job? And God said, yep, you just can't kill him. It seems to be what's happening here. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And Jesus let him. And he started sifting the disciples. Didn't they all betray Jesus? They all left him, okay? And he sifted them. And Jesus said, but I've prayed for you, Peter, When you turn back, because he had left, okay? When you turn back, you strengthen your brothers. And I can imagine that Peter remembered these words in his time of despair after he uh, rejected Jesus. Um, Then he replied, Peter, the braggadocious Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without a purse or a bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you go out, take a purse with you. Take take also a bag. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. And the disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. He said, that's enough. Okay? I think Jesus was teaching there. I could be wrong, but I think he was teaching there um, self-protection. Okay? He said, take your bag, take your cloak, and take a sword with you. You're going out as sheep amongst wolves. Don't let people take your life from you. You got a little sword. It was a defensive weapon. It was a small sword. He said, protect your family. The disciples had their families with them. So I think Jesus was saying, hey, the rough, dangerous world, there's people out there who will kill you. 
you protect your family, you protect them. It was a defensive weapon. It wasn't an offensive long sword. It was a short sword. So let's read on. Look at, actually, let's go to John chapter 13. Let's look at a parallel passage, kind of talking about the same stuff. But here's Peter and John in this one. I want you to hear what Peter and John say. We're looking at their lives. And, and we're looking at Peter, James, and John, and we're trying to figure out why Jesus picked them, right? He saw something. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Okay, so they're all at the table, the Last Supper. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple Jesus loved, and, and he's writing this, John, <laughs> was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Could you see Peter and John? (laughs) Right? Everybody knows John was Jesus' man. He loved John, close, close. So Peter, ask him. (laughs) We're dying to find out, right? Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, who is it, Lord? Jesus answered, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then... Dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had, had, was in charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Okay, now once Judas left, Jesus says this. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, to love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Don't you love Peter? It's like, he's in the mix, man, that guy. Where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. What's he talking about? The cross. Talking about death. That's where I'm going. I'm going to die. He said, Peter, you can't come now, but you will later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. (laughs) That's what Peter. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. (laughs) Wow. A lot was accomplished at the table. A lot was accomplished at the table. Here's something unique about Jesus. The gospel accounts record some 125 incidents of Jesus communicating with others. Okay? Jesus talking to people 125 times. That's just the ones the Bible talks about. Talking one-on-one with people. And about 54% of those encounters were initiated by his hearers. Okay? So, half of the time... Jesus is answering people's questions initiated by them. That's really interesting because here he is, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He could have come to earth, sat up in the the synagogue and preached the gospel to them. That could have been his communication style, but it wasn't. Most of the time, Jesus is walking and talking with the people. Like, not up here, he's down here. He's talking. And they say, hey, Jesus. Tell us about the end times. Okay, I'll tell you about the end times. (laughs) Hey, Jesus, if my brother dies and his wife is there, do I marry my brother? Or when we get to heaven, whose wife is he going to be? You know, they're asking him all these questions. (laughs) He's trying to stump him. And Jesus is presenting the gospel in an organic way in situations. And most, 50% of the time, is initiated by people. Is that cool? We never would have done that, man. It was up to us. If it was modern day preaching, right? Modern day preaching is this, and they teach you this in seminary, right? Um, 
This is deductive preaching. There's inductive preaching, there's deductive preaching. Deductive preaching is you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you just told them. <laughs> What's my main theme of the sermon? <laughs> Come out right out with it, okay? Right? All sinners are going to hell. That's your main theme. Then you go through the scriptures. Uh, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? It's appointed unto man to die once, and after that, face judgment. And then you tell them, all sinners are going to hell. And then you tell them that again. That's the way they teach you in seminary. That's not how Jesus taught. In fact, back in the day, all the religious leaders hated Jesus because he didn't preach like them. Because they preached in big flowery language and in deep biblical concepts that the people could not even hardly grasp. And that the people really didn't even care to know about. And they're using this flower and they look, they're dressed immaculately. And they're high up on this pedestal in the church. And they're, and they're like, ha, ha, and they're railing at the people. And they're teaching them these high lofty goals that the people are like, man, I'm just trying to put food on my table, man. <laughs> I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can be perfect. I like to eat meat. <laughs> I eat pork sometimes. Don't tell anybody. You know, and these people are just barely making it, and these preachers are just laying heavy burdens on them, right? And that's not Jesus, man. Isn't that cool? That's why the Pharisees hated Jesus. He didn't dance to their tune. And he taught them in simple terms, man. And it's called inductive preaching. It includes dialogue with people. It includes telling stories about their lives, about farming and, and crops. That's what they knew. So Jesus told little stories and parables, right, about their life. He got to know them personally because God could have could have just, like, put everything on stone and given it to people, but he didn't. Inductive is he came down. He was born in a manger as a baby. Jesus ex experienced everything we experienced growing all the way up to age 33. He experienced everything regular man experienced, and he became, he worked hard, hard job, right? And he, was, he came out from the people. He was one of the people. No wonder why the crowds flocked to Jesus. He knew their names. They knew of Jesus. He grew up there. He was a hometown boy. And he talked their talk. And he talked about what their, what their career was. He understood fishing. He understood planting and harvesting. He understood sifting of the wheat. He understood that. And he spoke their language in simple terms that they could understand. Totally broke the paradigm of the generation. And aren't you glad? And that's inductive preaching. And I love inductive. I'm learning, I'm reading a book about inductive preaching, but you will not ever hear pastors. And it's weird, because that's the way Jesus preached. But they teach in seminary. They don't teach that deductive preaching. But he was an inductive guy. And I think it's fascinating. Why are people not flocking to churches? Maybe pastors are way up here <laughs> and they don't associate you know a lot of pastors they got these big churches they come in from the side door they got a special office back there with a shower i wish i had a shower they come back there they look incredible they come out even when they dress sloppy they look awesome they're like movie stars of the christian world they'll never come over to your house though <laughs> and they won't have you to their house either and they live in a house, let me tell you. I was loving it. We had a Filipino family join our church, and they came over to my house. They're like, wow, it's so small. This is great. They were so proud of us. They said, in the Philippines, all the pastors have mansions. And it just kind of makes everybody feel bad because they don't have a house like the pastor has. And they were like so proud of me for having a small house. I was like, that's great. <laughs> I don't want to be Mr. Big Shot, right? And so these preachers come out, and they don't hang around you and me, but they hang around other celebrity preachers. And they hang around celebrities from Hollywood, and they have publicists, and they have manicurists. I never had a manicure in my life, man. I got more hangnails on my fingers. Are you with me? You can't be an inductive preacher and stand out and away from the people. These people love Jesus. I love that. So um, the people knew that he loved them. Um, the disciples, he picked, look at, look at who he picked. This tells you all about inductive preaching right there. He picked, 
He could have picked Bible scholars, rabbis, the cream of the crop, wearing fancy outfits with manicured nails, like good-looking, very good speakers. Who does he pick? Big, big Peter puts his foot in his mouth, right? And John, the sons of thunder, right? James and John, sons of thunder, they're really zealous and passionate, and they'll tell you what they're thinking at the drop of a hat. And they won't even ask you. (laughs) These were tough guys who got the job done. They were not the elite. They didn't have a degree. They were just hardworking, normal people. That's who Jesus picked. And it's very telling. And he wanted men of the people. He was a man of the people. And if he's going to build his kingdom, he's going to build his church, it's going to have to be normal people that do it. Right? And so that's good for you and me. Amen? We're normal people, and God's going to use us. So today is the celebration of the birthday of the church. You know, today's Pentecost Sunday. The church started. Jesus' church, the New Testament church, started on the day of Pentecost in the Bible. And Pentecost means the 50th. It was the 50th day after the first day of Passover. First day of Passover, 50 days later. Okay, this was a traveling feast, right? So they, they had these traveling feasts. And this one was called the Shavuot or Pentecost. It was also, also called the Feast of Weeks. Because it celebrated seven weeks and one day. Seven weeks and one day after the first day of Passover. They came back. So they were in Jerusalem for the Passover, right? They were celebrating with a Seder meal and all the events of the Passover week. Everybody came from all over the world to Jerusalem. Then they go back home after Passover. And then they come back seven weeks and a day later to have another celebration of Pentecost. And so... um, Seven weeks ago, we were celebrating what? Good Friday and then Easter, right? So it was actually uh, April 15th was Good Friday. April 17th was, was Easter, and we celebrated it here. Now we're seven weeks and one day later, and this, God, this is God's design. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. He says three times a year, you must come to Jerusalem to the temple, Right? There's a lot of method to God's madness. He's, he knows what he's doing. Three times a year shall all your men appear before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose. That's the temple. On the festivals of, of Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and Sukkot, the Festival of Booths, they shall not appear empty-handed. Check that out. They shall not appear empty-handed. Go to the next verse. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord our God, your God, has blessed you. Isn't that interesting? So he commands the people three times a year to make a pilgrimage with your families to the temple. And don't, he, he puts this in there. Don't come empty-handed. Don't come empty-handed. I think that's really interesting. Um, do you remember uh, last week I preached a sermon on um, all gave some and some gave all? It was a Memorial Day sermon. And that phrase, all gave some and some gave all, that's the Memorial Day phrase. They, they say it every year, right? Because it's talking about our veterans. Some died for you and me so we could have freedom. We talked about that last week. But I, I, I like that one of all gave some. And that's a philosophy right out of the Bible. Jesus said when you come to the church, you come with a gift, right? And God wants us to give 10% of our income to the church. It's called your tithe. And giving he wants us he's trying to teach us giving right he wants us to be the best givers in the world because when you go to the restaurant and your waitress is there and she's serving you and you're looking at her you're like man that girl looks she looks rough man have you ever looked at your waitress and think that girl's having a hard time or that guy you ever done that and then you need to give because she needs some encouragement that day right we should it should hurt, hurt our hearts and we should be compassionate people we should be the best givers in the whole world because god taught us it's in our dna right who's our father god our heavenly father right it's in his dna to give he gave his one and only son his very best son right to us he's a giver and so uh it's in our dna to be givers too so give 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 to your waitresses and your pool boy and whoever you got coming over your lawn guy tip them i gave a big tip once i'm just going to I'm not, like, bragging or anything. And I hate to use myself as an example, but this is really funny. 
the dude next door at the car wash, like a few months ago, I gave him a $20 tip. And he, and he, and I, he works there. He's still there. And I say, and he knows that I work here because he walks through my parking lot and we say, hey, so he works over there. So now, every time I go through there and I pay for the cheap, cheap car wash, you know, the $7 car wash, well, he bumps it up to the best one. He hits, he, get, he sees me and he says, put your car in neutral. Take your hands off the wheel, you know, that little thing. He goes, mm-hmm. And then he runs over there and he pops the executive car wash just for me pop and you know what that means that means multicolored bubbles coming down it's worth hey (laughs) it's worth that other seven bucks to get the colored bubbles and then the smell whoa who doesn't want a very good smelling car on the outside so you got "Mm, that smells so good i got colored bubbles i got this but then you get the chamois at the end and that's worth it baby right because those blowers are not enough no, really, they are actually, they are enough. Those blowers are high-powered. But then you get that chamois thing coming down on your car and just, whoop, all the little tiny bubbles come off. That's worth it. So he does that for me because I tipped him so good. I don't, I'm, I'm going to see how long that $20 will last me, though. If he stops pushing the good button, I'll know it's time for another 20 So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. This is so awesome. I love this. Who wrote the book of Acts? Nope. You guys are getting really close. Luke. Okay, I love Luke. Use the force, Luke. In my former book, Theophilus. Is that cool? Just that is so cool. Theophilus. That means lover of God. So this is written to people who are God lovers. Okay. In my former book, the book of Luke. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. After his suffering, okay, that's the cross, right? He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Okay, Jesus rose from the dead. He wanted to make sure people saw him, right? So he presented himself and, and, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now think about that for a second. 40 days of the risen, the risen Savior. 40 days. That's enough time for the tradesmen in the town to see Jesus. Oh my gosh, he's alive. And they have to go to another town to make some trades. They go to the other town. They tell those people, dude, you won't believe this, what's going on in Jerusalem. Jesus died on a cross. I saw it with my own eyes, and then I just saw him resurrected. He still has the nail prints in his hands. You need to check it out. He's still walking around. He's teaching. No, dude, I don't believe that. No, trust me. How long have you known me? Yeah, trust me. So they go. They make the three-day journey. Go back to Jerusalem. There's Jesus teaching about the kingdom of God. He's got the holes in his hands. Forty days. How many people, how, how long would it take for word to spread around the world? Not long. Not long at all. People are coming to see Jesus, the resurrected Lord. And he's there for 40 days. He wanted to make sure this planet knew that he was risen from the dead. Don't you love that? I love it. On one occasion, while, while he was eating with them, possibly at a table, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord. Okay, they're like totally off subject here. Like these disciples, man, they're, they like changing the subject. Lord, when, at, what, Lord are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, they're thinking revolution, right? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the dates or the times the Father is set by his own authority. But then Jesus changes the topic back to the Holy Spirit. (laughs) He said, but you'll receive power, everybody say power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the Great Commission reset again. Okay, So after, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. Come on, somebody. 
Did Jesus have a good entrance to the earth the first time? Star, shepherds, angels. I mean, it was an incredible entrance. Now that is an exit, baby. Talk about an exit strategy. <laughs> That's a good one. Well thought out, man. I'm going to be teaching the disciples then. I'm going up. I love Jesus, man. Great, creative, awesome. Jesus is awesome. When we get to heaven, I'm going to say, Dude, that was a great exit, man. Just rise up into the clouds, and they're going, oh, oh my gosh. And John probably said, okay, we got to do what he said. What did he say? I don't remember. Oh, Peter, he said we got to go wait in Jerusalem, right? So they go to Jerusalem, right? Seven weeks are going by, and one day until Pentecost, and they're, they weren't just sitting around. No, they had to elect another disciple. They had 12, they lost one. Who'd they lose? Judas. They lost Judas. Why? He betrayed Jesus. He felt so guilty. He threw the coins back at the Pharisees, and then he went and hung himself. So they needed to elect another one. And they, they elected another guy. He was the lead guitar player for the Scorpions. His name was, Ger he was a German dude named Matthias. Matthias, that was his name. Don't you love that name? If I have another child, I'm going to name him Matthias. I'm going to let him grow his hair long. I'm going to teach him guitar. But that won't happen. But maybe my grandchild. Matthias. But you know what happened to Matthias? Nothing. Do you know how they got Matthias? Yeah, they cast lots for him. It's like these are really... Well, I don't know. They're not like the smartest men in the world. They were fishermen. Okay? <laughs> they're like, okay. Why didn't they pray about this? Come on, they're disciples. They're like, hey, how are we going to pick another disciple? I don't know, dude. We got some lots here. Let's just cast some lots. <laughs> and then someone probably said, hey, maybe we should pray about it. It's kind of a big decision. No, man, let's just cast lots. <laughs> what? Well, let's pray about it. Ask Jesus. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Let's just cast lots. They cast lots, get the dude Matthias, and we never hear from him ever again. <laughs> it's like, what did you do, Matthias, man? You couldn't make the Bible? <laughs> he didn't do it. I would have hung out with Paul. I would have been all over the Bible. No, not Matthias, man. He was chosen by lots. So next time you need to make a big decision, just don't leave it up to chance. You pray about it and talk to your husband. Say, honey, we're going to pray. And we're going to fast, and we're going to, this is a big decision, right? And we're going to do that. Write that down. They chose Matthias. Not a good choice. Acts, look, look at Acts 2. I'm going to close with this. It's getting late. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each other. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the, as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all Galileans? Then how is it that we hear, uh, hear them in our native tongues? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders, wonders of God in our own tongues. I want to stop there for a second. That's our God. That's intuitive preaching right there. That he, should, he could have said, look, you guys all need to learn Hebrew. I'm going to give you the gospel in Hebrew. And if you don't know it, <laughs> that's your tough luck. But he didn't. That's, I'll tell you, people in the Philippines, they, they need to hear it in their language. They need to read it in their language. That's why I go to these fiber, fire Bible conferences, and we translate the Bible, the fire Bible, with all the notes, right? And we, treat, we translate all that in their language. They call it their heart language. So every man deserves to have the Bible in their language. Because we're not going to say, hey, you gotta read, you got to learn English. Come on, learn English and read the Bible, right? Aren't you glad they didn't do that to us? you got to learn Latin. <laughs> read the Latin Vulgate. Yeah, that's going to happen, <laughs> right? 
I ain't learning any, I can't even learn English. I failed in Spanish. I'm not a language guy, right? I just wouldn't read the Bible, I guess. But I'm glad someone translated it in my language. So we translate it in languages all over the world. In fact, our district, we meet for a golf tournament with the Fire Bible people, and we golf till we're sick. Oh. And then at night, we have conferences, and we translate the Bible into another language, right? It costs $400,000 to do that from start to finish, the Fire Bible into another language. So we've done many, many languages, just our district alone. We did the Nepali Fire Bible, and we translated that. It took three years, and we got the the translation of the Nepali Fire Bible. We printed these giant Nepali Fire Bibles and, and the men from our district went over there to Nepal, right, themselves. And they went with the missionaries and, and Jeff Dove, the president of Fire Bibles, and he speaks Chinese. Well, he's an American who looks like a lumberjack and he speaks Chinese. So awesome, love that guy. And so they go over there and the Nepali men are there, all the pastors are there and they don't have any Bible education. There's no Bible colleges in Nepal. And so they're there, they have their own little house churches, and they're so hungry for, for education in the Word. When they get the, the, the fire Bible, they said, my friends told me, that they said those men clutched it, they wrapped their arms around it, and they started crying because they finally had some education in God's Word. And they wept, and they cradled that thing like it was a gift from God Himself. And we're doing that. We're putting this in their language. And God did that. He said, you know what? I want these people to hear in their own languages. It's really important. So we do that. And we translate the Bible. We translate the fire Bible and into other people's languages. And it's costly. <laughs> but we do it. And uh, I love that. So um, Peter is an incredible example. Peter denied Jesus three times. And then he goes back to his old profession, right? He quit the ministry. Have you ever known pastors to, to fall, right? Peter fell, right? He didn't commit sexual sin, right? But you'll find pastors who, who fall, and they, you'll see them at Walmart working, or you'll see them doing this, working somewhere else. I know a guy, he uh, fell from grace, and he got another career. He's selling timeshares. He got rich selling timeshares. But you know what? When we get filled with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of, we have got to reinstate people like Jesus did to Peter. So Peter left the ministry, went back to fishing. Jesus shows up on the beach, cooks some fish, <laughs> probably didn't have a table. And they sit around, Jesus is eating with them. He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Maybe he's looking at the fish. Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And then he said this, some of the most remarkable words in the whole Bible. Remember, Peter was gone. Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times. He backslid, right? He rejected Christ in front of people. Jesus said, if you reject me before men, I'll reject you before my father. This is big. Peter says, I'm out of the ministry. I'm going back to fishing, my old profession. I got a family, right? He goes back there, and Jesus reinstates Peter. He says, um, do you love me more than these fish? He says, then feed my lambs, <laughs> tend my lambs. What? You want me back? Yeah, I want you back. I want you back. I forgive you. But, 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 I denied you three times. And one, one of those times he denied Jesus, and Jesus is being whipped, and he looks and catches, makes eye contact with Peter as Peter's denying him. And it's like, I told you, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. Peter was busted, man, and Peter felt terrible. Remember Judas? Judas? Judas betrayed Jesus. He went out and hung himself. Who knows what the disciples were feeling? They were all like, they were all beaten and abused by the devil. They all scattered. Peter's feeling terrible. And he says, feed my lambs. What? Are you kidding? But I'm out, man. I denied you. No, you're not out, man. You're back in. You're back in the game. You're back on the team. What? Yeah, Peter, I forgive you. Remember Jesus said this? If you say anything against the Holy Spirit, I will not forgive you. But if you say anything against me, I will forgive you. Like Jesus said, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Peter, you didn't hurt my feelings. I knew it was going to happen. I'm not hurt, Peter. I was over it before it happened, <laughs> right? 
Peter, you're back in the game. You're reinstated. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. He said, tend my lambs, that's little sheep. Then he said, feed my sheep, that's big sheep. <laughs> that's sheep, that's people. Peter, you're in the people business, not the fish business. Peter, I know you've made a big mistake, but you're back in. And I love that. And I'm telling you, we're spirit-filled Christians. You know what that means? Reinstate people. Forgive people. People are going to hurt you. Your mom's going to hurt you. Your daddy's going to hurt you. People are going to diss you. They're going to disrespect you, deny you. But you know what? Forgive them and invite them to dinner. It, you want to be Pentecostal, man, you're going to have to do a lot of forgiving. I love it that he reinstated Peter, and then he reinstated all the disciples probably, right? Well, all he had to do was reinstate Peter, and the word got around, right? Because Peter was the man. Reinstates Peter, and that sends a message to all of us here today. In life, you're going to do some really stupid things. Peter thought, no, I'll never deny you. I'll go to prison for you. I'll die for you. Remember, he took out his sword and was going to cut Malchus's head right in the middle. Wouldn't that be gross? And Malchus said, whoo, and off went his ear. What if he didn't like, whoo, and that thing cut him right, cut his head right in half? Ooh, Jesus would have said, <laughs> and he healed him. But that would have been the greatest. You know, Jesus put his hand on his ear and healed his ear, put his ear, picked his ear up. Oh, here's your ear. Let me put it back on. What if he would have got him down the head, right down the middle? That would have been cool. Jesus, put it together. <laughs> wow. But reinstatement, I love it. You're going to commit some crimes in your life because you're all, people are all like, oh, the man, like, like Peter. I walked on water, man. I'm going to die for you. Pride goes before a fall, right? That's why we should always pray and stay humble before God because once you think you're not going to fall, right? The devil says, good, I got him where I want. He's proud, prideful. And then he gets you in your weakest moment. He'll wait patiently for you to get weak and he'll make you fall. He'll entice you to fall. He can't make you fall. But thank God that Jesus is a reinstater. Amen? And then Peter... Dude, he goes from denying Jesus, he's reinstated, and then on the day of Pentecost, thousands of people are there like, what's going on, man? We heard this noise. How, how, how loud was that noise, the rushing mighty wind, <laughs> right? How loud was that if people heard it on the street? It was super loud. So all these thousands of people come, and like, there's 12 disciples, they're like looking at each other, come on, John, you're Jesus' beloved. It wasn't John. It wasn't John who stood up and preached the greatest sermon. It wasn't John. It was the man who jumped out of the boat and walked on water. It was Peter. He stood right up. He didn't wait for anybody else. <laughs> he stood up and gave the greatest sermon, and thousands of people got saved that day. Peter, who denied Jesus, now he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he's super preacher Peter. That's what happens when you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You can do things you would never do on your own. You can say things you would never say to people on your own. But with the power of God in you, you'll do things. Can you, if you just think about this for a second, our abilities are limited. We'll only say certain things in certain circumstances. We'll only do certain things in certain circumstances. We won't try that. That's not my nature, right? Our, with our abilities, they're very limited. But with the Holy Spirit's abilities, they're unlimited. If you want to live life on your own, on your own abilities, your own strength, you go right ahead. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want my life to be unlimited in what I do, what I say, where I go, what God does through me. How many want unlimited? Don't you want that? 